Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. So we're going to talk about the second half of scuba diving, and this is probably more applicable to you and, and what you'll see because this is mostly about clearance um, when scuba divers come in. So just to review last time, we talked a little bit about how you can get in trouble with scuba diving. Can I go online? We have to make it a certain period of time. No, that's fine. Okay, good. Um, and, and really you can get in trouble with the laws of physics where you get too much gas um, dissolved and that comes out too fast or you go up too quickly and things over expand. Um, it, one of the other issues that's a big deal is passing out and becoming uncon unconscious underwater. So as we go through our list of things today, if somebody has a medical condition where they could possibly lose consciousness, that should be an absolute contraindication to diving. And um, there's some things that are relative, some things that are absolute, and there are some things in the middle that are changing. Um, we'll address diabetes a little bit, and it used to be absolutely not, and now a lot of uh, people with diabetes are diving safely. So I'll go through some of, some of the things that no, 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 not ever, maybe, and, and yes, even um, though you might think to yourself, really, that's a yes, and, and there are a lot of things that, uh, are yes that didn't used to be a yes. You can still, um, I told you last time about the Divers Alert Network um, at Duke University, and they're still a great resource to call and say, hey, I have this, you know, in my case, it's usually a student at the university that wants to take the scuba class. They have this medical condition. Is there a way I can let them dive safely? So again, um, that's a great resource for you. So let's go through fitness to dive who you're going to clear, and who you're going to say no to. So again, scuba is self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, and most people aren't attached to anything anymore, self-contained. So you can, see them, um, you can see them going around without some kind of surface supplied air. Um, we talked about how many million sport divers there are and how many new certifications annually and you'd be surprised at how many people dive in places that aren't Hawaii, Philippines, things like that. And so probably what you'll be doing most likely are pre-dive exams and those are for new certifications. Um, again, we talked last time about some of the dive-relating injuries in emergency care, which I think you're less likely to see, although you may have someone come home with a dive-related problem. Um, depending on where you live, if you're near some kind of a, a lake or a quarry or an ocean, they, there may be people that are commercial divers that need continuing certification to dive. And if you're going to be doing those kind of exams, um, you should get some extra education in in terms of clearing scuba divers. Um, and then again, just about everybody else has some kind of a some kind of a part to play in scuba diving. So there is an organization called the Recreational Scuba Training Council, and they made a uniform medical assessment form. So there are different groups that you can dive with. Um, Patty's probably the most common one we see here, and that's just um, that's just a group that certifies divers and teaches them and they have their own set plan. But this recreational scuba training council has a uniform, basically uniform form that everybody can use. And so just like we talked about, when you think about can I let this person dive or not, you need to think would, the, would diving cause a problem for them in their medical condition or would their medical condition represent an increased risk for a, a dive injury for both the diver and the dive buddy? So well, let's just take an example of um, a diver with a disability. Um, I used to help a diver who was blind. And that kind of a situation, you would actually want to have three dive buddies. Because if something happened to me, my, my dive buddy needs to be able to do all the things um, that a dive buddy could do. And so in the case of our diver who was blind, we had three of us. So again, if you, um, it's not just the diver and their medical condition, it's can they take care of their buddy as well? And if they can't, then you might wanna say, hey, that you should have three people or, 
or more with your diet. So let's go through some of this. This one, um, this is probably an area where we see a lot of issues in diving. And I think probably about 20 to 30 percent of deaths in diving actually come from cardiac disease. And as we always talk about in sports, sometimes the first sign of your cardiac disease is cardiac arrest and death, right? And in diving, um, some people get into it when they're young, but a lot of people dive when they're older, um, and then that being because a lot of times you need some time off and some money to dive because you might be flying and going to an exotic country, the equipment can be expensive, and so you will see a fair amount of people who are 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s even who are diving, and that is a range of people that have more cardiovascular risk than when you're uh, less than 35. So all these things that are relative contraindications, gee, have you had a bypass, have you had a stent, have you had an MI, hypertension, do you have some type of an arrhythmia, dysrhythmia, valve problem, mitral valve prolapse, pacemaker, etc. There are a lot of those people who can dive. Um, you may not want to put them out in a 20, uh, 20 mile an hour current in 40 degree water to dive, but uh, there are a lot of those that can dive. But typically, people who have had that cardiac intervention before ought to see their cardiologist. A lot of times they'll want to put them on a treadmill and do a, a pretty intense bruise protocol before they actually get cleared to dive. So it's totally fine for you to say, gee, your hypertension's under control, or your cardiologist has cleared you from your MI to get back to exercise, but let's just have you go see them before I sign off on the final dive clearance, or let's have them sign off on the cardiac part of the final dive clearance. Things that are absolute contraindications. Uh, remember the bubbles that got us in trouble? So the bubbles typically come in the venous circulation, kind of get filtered out by the lungs, and then um, they don't get sent out to the organs, but if you have a shunt that goes right across your heart somewhere and you can have bubbles that get on the wrong side, bubbles connect just like clots. So people with shunts, those are VSDs, ASDs. We're going to talk a little bit about a patent frame in a valley, but any, anybody that has a big VSD or an ASD shouldn't die. Um, the septal hypertrophy, and again, we're talking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where we don't clear those folks for a lot of other sports either, shouldn't die. Valvular stenosis, because again, if you're going to be carrying something heavy, swimming hard, trying to save someone, getting in and out of a boat, and your cardiac output isn't great, um, they shouldn't dive, and then certainly um, congestive heart failure, especially if it's not compensated. So in, with cardiovascular, it's totally okay to get the cardiologist involved, and you probably should. And then there are some people you just have to say, you know what, this shouldn't be your sport. So pain in foramen ovale. Foramen ovale is there um, uh, before we're born so that blood can shunt around the lungs since they're not being used. Unfortunately, in some people, that doesn't seal all the way down, and under certain circumstances, what can happen is then blood with bubbles can move from the right side of the brain over to the left, I mean the right side of the heart over to the left side of the heart, and then those bubbles can actually go to your organs and cause problems, and the brain probably being the most common one. So a, an issue in diving is, gee, should we be screening everybody with an echo and a bubble test before they dive to see if they have a per patent for amen ovale because that could put them at risk for a diving injury. They look at people who have had serious decompression illness, and if you, can, if you can see that third line down, 65% of divers with a serious decompression sickness, and they look back in retrospect, they also had a patent frame in Ovalley versus only 5% of the people who were controls didn't have it. So the scuba diving um, community has said, no, it's really probably not indicated to screen everybody with an echo and a bubble test before we let them scuba dive. However, if you get somebody whose dive profile seemed within the range of, of a nice normal dive, they didn't do anything wrong, and, and they had this 
more serious decompression illness, those are the people that probably ought to have a bubble test. And, and what they do basically is they, um, they do an echo and they put some um, bubbles in and they see if those go across. Basically, those are probably the people you want to work up. And then if they do have it, and they've had this serious decompression sickness or a gas embolism, they probably shouldn't, um, they may, you know, they have to know they're at increase to continue diet. So it's one of those things that this may come up if you, if you have somebody who knows they have a patent for amen, again, you might want to counsel them or you might want to actually have them talk to either a dive medicine person or a cardiologist about that. But where it, where it probably would like to come up for you is, hey, I was, you know, I was on my vacation and I got decompression sickness and I really was following all the dive guidelines and I don't know why it happened, then those people are someone you might want to work up. Okay, so let's just go through some of the various um, some of the various organ systems, and we'll talk about things. Um, pulmonary is a pretty important one because this is one of those gas-filled organs that we talk about, and some of the relative contraindications, um, and certainly one that used to be an absolute contraindication was reactive airway disease or asthma, or exercise-induced bronchospasm, and then people who have had tumors or cavitating lung lesions where there could be um, some sort of an air-filled area that they can't really clear um, can be at risk. History of a pneumothorax is um, a relative contraindication. If you've had a pneumothorax due to some kind of trauma, you're probably okay to die. But if you've had a spontaneous pneumothorax for unknown reason, what would happen if you had a pneumothorax 100 feet down? It's already a problem. Getting the air out's already a problem, right? So now as you come up and that air expands, you know, that you can die from that. So people who've had the spontaneous pneumothorax, these are the tall, thin, sometimes it's student health center, male, comes in, I've had this chest pain for a couple days, no trauma, do an x-ray, has a spontaneous pneumothorax, probably should not be scuba diving. And, and restrictive lung disease, again, you have to be able to reach a certain level of exercise capacity to dive. And if they can't do that, you don't want to clear them. Kind of talked about that. Absolute as, you know, asthma, reactive airway disease, if it's active, um, they should not be diving. Um, if they have a problem with exercise-induced COPD or abnormal PFTs or a positive um, challenge like a methacholine challenge test, again, shouldn't be diving. Um, any kind of restrictive lung disease with exercise impairment because, again, you know, it's not, it, it's a sport where you think, gee, it's pretty easy, you just float around in the water, but there are times when you have to swim hard to get yourself in or out or someplace else or help a buddy, and if you can't do that, you don't want to be diving, and then the history of the spontaneous pneumothorax, because a pneumothorax at depth would be really a big issue. So let's talk a little bit about asthma and diving, because it used to be just an absolute no. If you have asthma, you can't dive. They thought there would be too much air trapping. They thought they would have overexpansion injuries, and they thought that they would um, die from that. Well, what happened, and, and in, in um, England, Great Britain, they have a lot, a lot of diving there. And what they found is that people, you know, you rely on your patients when they come in with their form to check the box that I have a history of asthma. And if they come in with the form or they don't even have to come in with the form because they don't check the box, they have a history of asthma, and they go diving anyway, who's to know, right? The dive instructors aren't doing a medical exam. Um, they give you a form, you say, I don't have any medical issues. So what they found out is there are a lot and a lot of people diving with asthma who were doing fine and weren't having problems and weren't dying from air trapping. So they decided, well, we're going to do some studies to look at these people and see, are there people who can dive safely? And there are. But it's sort of different than who you think it might be. Again, we, we historically thought it was an absolute contraindication. 
And they thought air trapping was going to be a risk. They were going to trap a lot of air. They were going to come up. They were overexpand and hamburger lung, and they were going to die. And then more recently, like I said, they found there were a lot of people that were diving with asthma, and they hadn't had any injuries. So who could dive with asthma? And so I think when, um, when I talk to the fellows or I talk to people that I work with, most people say, well, the people who can dive with asthma maybe are those ones who only need their inhaler every once in a while. They don't really have bad asthma. They just, you know, every once in a while have a problem. And that's actually not who they recommend clearing to dive. People they recommend clearing to dive are actually the ones who have known asthma and are controlled and can monitor themselves. And the folks who have sort of the, well, I'm not really sure when I'm going to need my inhaler, um, probably shouldn't dive because it's really hard to use an inhaler underwater. It's no inline device on your scuba regulator that can puff some albuterol in. So um, this is probably the most common thing we see at the Student Health Center. Our patients fill out their form to take the class, and a lot of them check the box, I have asthma, and then in they come to see us. And so what we'll, we'll look them over and try to find out what kind of asthma and what they're being treated with you know, at the time. And again, the recommendation is if you have mild to moderate asthma, your screening spirometry is normal, you can be um, considered to be a candidate for diving, and that's what they recommend for the screening spirometry. Um, if a diver has an asthma attack, they shouldn't be diving until their airway function returns to normal. And that's a bummer if you've paid for a week in a tropical climate and the second day out you get your asthma attack, but that, that's the recommendation. So folks that want to dive with asthma need to be aware there's probably still some sort of increased risk, and if you have a problem, you've got to abort the rest of your diving for you know the day, the week, whatever there is. And so these are the folks, the exercise, the cold-induced, the emotional asthma that just happens once in a while, and they don't know when it happens, those are the people that really shouldn't probably be diving. And so it's almost, you know, it almost seems like, okay, let's see, the folks who have worse asthma but it's controlled on a regular basis can dive, and the ones that only need their inhaler every once in a while can't, and that, that is the recommendation. And then down at the bottom, um, again, if they're on a chronic bronchodilator and even inhaled steroids, but their pulmonary function is normal, they're thought to be able to dive. If they need to use their rescue inhaler, um, they no diving within 48 hours, and of course, if they have ongoing asthma symptoms, they shouldn't dive. So what do we do when we get them in our clinic? You know, I have some sort of history of asthma. If they really have just, I use my inhaler every once in a while when I get emotional, to say, you know what, you're really not somebody who we can clear to dive. But if they're controlled, we have a setup with um, uh, Dr. Lucia over at Pulmonary Medicine, and he will do the methacholine challenge test for the divers. Um, and they'll just do the methacholine challenge so it doesn't cost them too much because a lot of our students are college kids. They'll go over, they'll have their test, and if they pass that, then they can dive with certain um, recommendations. Um, and if they can't pass it, they don't. So we really do make them have a test um, to see if they can be cleared to dive. So it's a little bit. Is there a question? Sorry, I thought I it's okay. <laughs> so it's a little bit more work for them to dive if they have a history of asthma, but Keep in mind, if it's someone who has asthma, who's controlled, even if they're controlled on steroids, if they really want to do it, they can. Um, and those folks who, gee, my asthma flares up, but I'm not sure when, it would be bad to have that happen down at depth, so they can't die. Does that kind of make sense? Now that I talked about it. <laughs> okay, so what about all the neurological stuff? Again, what kind of things would you think about, what, what one thing would you say no to a diver with neurological, a thing that's neurological? Epilepsy? Yeah, seizures. <laughs> Bad thing to have at death, right? 
because you can't keep the regulator in your mouth and you can't breathe and you lose consciousness, uh, you drown. So you can have a seizure on land and it's bad, but seizure underwater is way worse. So yes, anybody who has some kind of a neurological issue, change, you know, altered consciousness, lose consciousness, they shouldn't die. And then all these relative contraindications for diving more have to do with if they were diving and one of these things got worse, could I tell the difference between a decompression sickness type neurologic issue and their unrelated neurologic issue? So all these things are that are relative contraindications, um, a lot of them have to do with can you, can you tell should you be treating them or not? So a lot of these people actually get to dive. Um, some people's migraines get worse in the cold water. Some people get the mask squeeze, um, trigeminal neuralgia. Sometimes they have trouble with that nerve because of either the mask or the cold water. So some of these things, people dive and just have more problems. So you get bad migraines every time you dive, you may not want to. Um, so it's more of a relative contraindication. It's not an absolutely you can't. Um, some of the disc stuff, again, if you have a fixed neurologic deficit, you know it's there, and now you come out of the water after maybe you stayed down too long and you've got some neurologic symptoms in a whole different spot that you've never had before, um, that, that can make you suspicious for DCS, and you wouldn't really say, hey, you absolutely can't dive because of that. But you just need to talk to them about um, watching out for symptoms, here are your fixed symptoms, and can you do the things that you need to do. And so absolute contraindications, history of seizures, except the folks who had a childhood febrile seizure 24 years ago and have never had one since. Um, and if you're confused or you don't know, and, and they're not sure, you can always have them see a neurologist and have an EEG and see. But most of the time, the childhood seizure was pretty well documented. Had a fever when I was three, had one seizure, never had anything since, and I'm in my 20s, they can die. Um, tumors or aneurysms, anything that could be made worse um, underwater. And again, history of a cerebrovascular accident or a TIA. Um, again, they say you, can't, you couldn't really tell, or gee, am I actually able to do the stuff that I need to do to die? Spinal cord injury of deficits, because you could become a lot worse if you did get DCS. So it's probably just in, in a lot of those cases not worth it in case, if you did have some kind of a diving injury. And then this history of type 2 decompression sickness with a neurologic deficit um, that kept stayed as a neurologic deficit. A, one issue is why were you at risk for it anyway? And now you have a neurologic deficit. And could it, you know, could it happen again? And could we tell if it happened again because of your issues? So there are some people um, who have had that happen and continue diving because you might be clearing someone to dive for their initial certification or in a case of a commercial driver for their ongoing certification. But once I'm certified to dive, nobody can stop me right now from going right up to Lake Tahoe and going in, no matter what medical issue I have. So you can do your best, but sometimes people get around these things. If they're coming to you and asking, these would be your recommendations. Okay, so lots of stuff with uh, ear, nose, and throat because, again, we're talking about air-filled areas. So folks who have had issues that might not allow them to equalize, they um, can have problems at depth, and it's more related to, gee, I perforate my eardrum. What happens when you put cold water in a perforated eardrum? Bad, right? Dizzy, scary, panicky. Uh, you know, other kinds of issues go to the surface with a panic descent, a bigger problem. So the EMT stuff, again, usually wants to either be under control, cleared, or not by the EMT ahead of time. So recurrent otitis or sinusitis where they might not be able to clear, and if they don't have a, an infection at the time, they can probably dive, but if they have a, you know, bad... Oh, ear infection or sinus infection shouldn't go in the water that day. 
Um, obstruction of the canal can cause you to have trouble equalizing. Um, people who've had significant cold injury to their ears, just like any other kind of frostbite, are going to be at recurrent risk. The eustachian tube dysfunction, perforation of the TM, somebody, of course, who would, um, would have tubes would be an absolute contraindication. But if it's healed, you know, any kind of previous surgeries, significant hearing impairment, again, relative. Can you, you know, you can't talk underwater anyway, unless you have, there are some communication systems that most recreational divers don't have. So again, these are relative contraindications and you just, if they have those kind of things, um, look through it, gee, would it cause a risk to you? Would it cause a risk to your buddy? Um, and can you die? History of TMJ, why is that a relative contraindication? Because you have to hold that mouthpiece in. You can get a custom mouthpiece, you can adjust it, but some people, especially when they're first diving and they're nervous, uh, they chop down a lot and their TMJ will bother them more. But again, it's a relative contraindication. It's not typically going to be life-threatening, it's not typically going to threaten your partner. But absolute contraindications are, you know, basically can, could, can water get in to the, uh, <laughs> to the middle ear. And a monomeric tympanic membrane is just one that's just one cell layer thick. Sometimes it's hard for us to even see it. A lot of times the ENTs look at those. And that's just one that's so at risk for perforation. And then anybody who has an open perforation tubes, any of the history, the round window rupture, inner ear surgery, all those type of things, it's not worth it to dive because those things can be made worse. Um, and again, they've got a lot of different uh, things here, you know, a tracheostomy, I guess fairly obvious, but you'd have to have your regulator down there, it would be hard. Um, so again, if, you, if you're worried about it, you can always ask the ENT, but most of these things, they just shouldn't be scuba diving. We don't see a lot of those in the people that we try to clear. Um, GI stuff, again, more irritable bowel, peptic ulcer, malabsorption, the functional bowel disorder. Some people, because the, um, the, the wetsuit, if you're wearing a wetsuit, is tight, some people do have more trouble with reflux. I tell them, well, if you have bad reflux, see how it goes. It could be made a little bit worse. Um, but for the most part, not a lot of, uh, you know, most of those things you can get around. If you're going to have some kind of a functional bowel disorder and, gee, you have trouble underwater every time you scuba dive, you have to have a bowel movement, that's bad in a scuba suit. So, again, they may not want to dive, but probably not life-threatening. Absolute contraindications for the GI tract include any kind of thing, again, where there could be air trapping, they could overexpand. So you can look at you can look at some of these things. Most of these people don't want to dive anyway, but uh, you know, a big abdominal wall hernia that may, might have bowel in it. You do see some older folks with those kind of things. That should probably those things should probably be fixed and then cleared before they dive. We don't see a lot of this, but these are the um, are the recommendations. So again, relative contraindications for the metabolic stuff. If, if any of their current issues would be worse. Obesity only in that could they, can they do what they need to do to get in and out of the water and help someone else in and out of the water. Um, obesity in the water is actually a little easier to get around because um, of the buoyancy of the water. I mean, the absolute contraindication was always diabetic on insulin therapy or an an oral antihypoglycemic medication that may predispose them to loss of consciousness due to hypoglycemia. And so that was always an absolute no, and that really has changed in the last 10 years um, so that folks who are well controlled um, can be cleared to dive. And really, if you're type 2 on a medication or type 2 on metformin and you aren't at risk for hypoglycemia, Go ahead and exercise. Go ahead and dive. Um, for type 1, there are a whole list of recommendations, and mostly that those kind of things are you should be well controlled. You probably should be on insulin for at least a year. Know how to take care of yourself. Have a dive buddy who knows how to take care of you. Have some kind of insulin. 
maybe even a glucagon, shot of glucagon can, can increase your blood sugar. And then the recommendation is to test two hours before, an hour before, or half an hour before, do shallow dives, see how, if at all, it affects blood sugar, and do some of those things either in a pool or shallow water before you actually go out and dive. But if, if you're pretty well controlled and you have a buddy who's comfortable and you don't have a lot of episodes of hypoglycemia, people with diabetes dive all the time. The um, one thing I wanna say about that, and again, in the younger kids, so you can start diving at fairly young ages now, but they do say if you're a type one, you need insulin, that you probably ought to wait until you're over 18, because the insulin requirements in adolescents vary so widely, and um, they may not be as good at managing that by themselves. It may be a relatively new diagnosis, so open water diving shouldn't start until over 18 if you have an insulin pump or using insulin. So every once in a while you'll have a young person come in um, who wants to dive and you say, well, there are some special training programs who will let them go in a pool um, at age 16. So you don't wanna, you know, again with sports medicine, we want people to participate, but you want them to participate safely. And for the really, the young, the young, um, Divers with diabetes maybe um, well, they recommend that they should wait until they're 18 to start the open water diving. And then when you do dive um, with diabetes, there's still a risk of hypoglycemia. So you don't want to get yourself in positions where you can't surface quickly. So maybe tech diving where you go down 300 feet isn't the best idea for you. Um, overhead environment, you know, cave diving in a wreck where you can't get right up. Uh, might not be such a good um, recommendation. If you go deep enough that you can get nitrogen narcosis, it may be hard for you or your buddy to tell, does he have nitrogen narcosis or is this a hypoglycemic episode? So maybe you dive in the 60 to 80 uh, foot water range. So if you have um, a diver with insulin dependent diabetes, you don't have to clear that on your own. Um, again, in, in Britain they have these, they call them dive referees and they're actually primary care physicians who have a specialized scuba diving training. And so if you have a, a diver with diabetes in the UK, they go to their, their doctor who takes care of the diabetes to get cleared, and then they go to the special scuba referee to get cleared, and the primary care person really doesn't have a lot of say. Um, they want them, you know, they want them to actually be double cleared. And then does that scuba referee dive with them? No, that would just be a physician, but then they have a trained partner. So that might be a parent, that might be, you know, a teacher, it, it might be an instructor, but probably not, because they're going to be taking care of everyone else. But your partner needs to know, here are the signs, here's what to give you, and here's how to give a shot of glucagon if we get back up on board. And, and so you can dive with diabetes, it's more complicated, but it's, you know, and it, it may mean that you have to refer them here and there, but it's not an absolute contraindication Unless they're under 18, probably should wait on that one. Patty, did you have a question? Yes, yes thank, thank you. you. Um, um, for for, for like, like two in a dog, mm -hmm. they did not have to look aside for you know, not take it that day? Well, if, they, if they've had episodes of hypoglycemia, um, you know, it should, they should wait for a few months and make sure that their diabetes is stable. So if they're a person who takes it and they do have episodes of that, um, then there are a couple different ways you could do that. G don't do it that day, but most of the time, um, if they're not really prone to episodes of hypoglycemia, you don't really need to worry. Those people, I would say, start shallow and see what, if anything, Diving does, it's like exercise, it is exercise, so it may or may not lower your blood sugar, but I would do some practice runs on them um, in shallower water in the pool and let them monitor it. Um, if they are at risk for hypoglycemia, then that may be somebody who you say, don't dive, you know, or rather than let's let your blood sugar go to 500, because then you have all those issues, you get in the water, and you pee already because it's cold and there's pressure and so you know you can you really can have some electrolyte abnormalities if your blood sugar is really high and you've peed off all your fluids so 
I think that I would make sure my person doesn't have episodes of hypoglycemia, and if so, I would say, let's get you stable for three to six months before we have you start to die. Thank you. Thank you. You're going to see more people, though, because there, there are more out there. Um, I've had, I actually wrote a whole policy on our student athletes participating with diabetes because we have a lot of uh, kids who are really good athletes. They've had well-controlled diabetes. They've had a pump and they can get to the level of participating at a Division I university. And so that's great that we're better at treating it, that people can do these kind of things, so you'll see them. But don't hesitate again. If there is some kind of risk of hypoglycemia, you can say, got to make sure that this is taken care of before. And for new diabetics, they recommend you've been on your insulin for a year, and you pretty, and you pretty well know how to do it. So if you get a 19-year-old that's still is you know up and down up and down up and down not well controlled diving is a sport where you stay safe if you're disciplined and if you're careless you know so if i had someone who's really careless with their diabetes gee how are they going to be with their gauges and their air and their time on top of diabetes so again that might be someone i talked to about well maybe you snorkel <laughs> okay what do you think about pregnancy and diving yeah. Um, Chuck, did that help answer your question about divers with diabetes? We can hear you. Go ahead. If anybody has any questions, you can call, email, um, and if I can't answer it, we can find someone who can. Um, so pregnancy, right, absolutely contraindicated. You shouldn't dive if you're pregnant. Now, have people gone on their honeymoon and, and gone diving and been pregnant? Oh, yeah, sure. Have people not known they were pregnant and, and gone diving and then found out later? Yes. But really, there is a theoretical risk to the fetus, and you just don't want them diving. So pregnancy, the answer is no. So behavioral health issues, you know, relative contraindication, when they talk about developmental delay, again, you have to be able to do certain things to dive. You have to be able to look at certain things, understand certain things, and make decisions underwater. So if you can't do that, then probably shouldn't be diving. Um, this history of drug or alcohol abuse, it's a relative contraindication. We talked about pressure before. We talked about partial pressures. We talked about drugs and alcohol can have more of an effect at, on you at depth. So it really would not be good to have had a couple shots and go down diving for a variety of reasons. And um, probably wouldn't want your dive buddy doing that either. So history of drug or alcohol abuse and ongoing, I can't stop to, to, to dive or if they have um, other medical problems going along with that. And then the history of previous psychotic episodes, you know, if you've ever gone diving, um, even when you snorkel, I think you probably all know, or let's just pretend like put your face in cold water and try to keep it under there. If you're with a snorkel, and the first thing you want to do is, <laughs> and you get a little panic, you get claustrophobic. When you're scuba diving, especially if you're diving in cold water where you have a lot of weight, you have a thick wetsuit, you may have a really tight hood, gloves, tanks, you might have 80 pounds of stuff on you, and then you're going down in this cold water, it really can cause people to panic, anxiety, claustrophobia. So if they have problems, um, other mental health issues that might make that worse, psychotic episode, again, underwater wouldn't be good. But it depends on how well controlled they are and what the issue was. This is kind of an interesting one. Um, that first one, inappropriate motivation to dive to please a partner or spouse. You know, we're going to go on our trip of a lifetime, and if someone's really scared of the water, doesn't want to dive, prone to panic, um, you know, probably not a good idea to do that. But, gee, my partner really wants to dive, and so they, they go along with it. And I actually had a patient who came in. And she, didn't, she was deathly afraid of the water and deathly afraid and wanted to be cleared for scuba. And we had a long talk. And then I had her partner come in. And I said, you know, 
you can dive with the, a boat and a dive, and she can be on the boat, they can be right there, she can snorkel above. But this woman does not want to put her head all the way under the water, and she would be at risk, and so would her partner if she panicked and, and couldn't do what she needed to do. So sort of that, I just want to do this, but I'm really scared of the water or breathing underwater, etc. probably shouldn't dive. Um, bad claustrophobia, agoraphobia, again, panic is a bad thing. Um, active psychosis, or if they're on psychotropic medications, because you don't know how those medications are going to affect them underwater. Um, panic disorder, where it's uncontrolled. Um, and then again, active, actively using drugs or alcohol are a bad thing underwater. Um, so those are reasons that uh, those kind of folks, these are the ones that you sit down and you talk to a little bit more. So sickle cell trait, and we might have talked about that before in some of our clinics, but sickle cell trait in conditions where of low oxygen hypoxia can sickle, and then those act like clots, just like the bubbles we've talked about. You can have a, a number of problems with that. A, acute anemia, again, where you're, you might have to get your heart rate up, and if you can't do that um, because you don't have enough RBCs to carry oxygen, that can be a problem. And then absolute contraindications, sickle cell disease, uh, polycythemia and leukemia, again, most of the time those folks probably aren't healthy enough that, you know, active, untreated polycythemia or leukemia. So those are thought to be contraindications. Again, all these things, if someone really wants to die, you can go back to their um, specialist and say, here's what our recommendations are, what do you think? And sometimes they fall in the middle and they might be cleared to dive in um, a circumstance that's not too demanding. So really the um, orthopedic stuff, I think mostly relates to, would my condition get worse and can I move appropriately underwater or on and off the boat? So it just depends on what they do and how they do it. I had a patient, I had a friend I dove with all the time, had bad chronic back pain. And I think I told you before, dive master put her, we dove off a boat, put her tanks in the water, she'd get in, dive, come back up, take her stuff off, somebody else would take it in the boat. And it was one of her favorite activities that she could do because underwater, her back didn't hurt. Um, you can sometimes get a little bit hyperextended extension, kind of like swimmers get. So some people, it can make their low back pain worse. But again, you kind of take these on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if they, the aseptic, aseptic necrosis of the hip, some of the commercial divers do have trouble with aseptic necrosis of the hip. Um, it's a risk. And so if somebody's going to dive long and hard and do deep diving and they already have that, it, it, you have to talk to them about it. That could possibly make it worse. But it's not something that you typically see in recreational divers. Um, really, absolute contraindication is I couldn't move around or I couldn't help my buddy. Or something acute, you know, my arm's in a cast. I probably should have dived at that point and might be able to be cleared. So an acute or chronic orthopedic injury that might be made worse. Or, again, that I couldn't help my dive buddy get in or out of the water or if I needed to do that. And, and in that case, if I was otherwise okay to dive, maybe three of us dive together and you talk ahead of time about what might happen. Okay, after all that, what's the most common reason? Does anybody want to hazard a guess? We talked about cardiac. Cardiac stuff does happen, but it's this. And it's because of all those overexpansion things that can happen when you rapidly rush to the surface, either with too many gas bubbles in your blood or too much air in your lungs and panic. Perforated my TM, something went haywire, I had a panic attack, etc., etc. I'm going to rush to the surface holding my breath. That's where the acute gas embolism, you know, lung, brain, heart, wherever those bubbles go. And so that's actually, so when you talk to people about scuba diving, that, that part about inappropriate, you know, diving to please somebody else, and I'm really scared to do this, they're really at risk. So that and cardiac and asthma are probably the three things that we talk about with patients the most. Um, but panic behavior shouldn't be underestimated. And so I always say, why do you want to dive? 
you know, and how do you do underwater, and <laughs> how are you with cloud, you know, tidal dark places? So again, it's don't underestimate the psychological part. Although we talked about a lot of physical things, and that's a really important piece. So, what questions do you have about all that? Kind of went through it again fast. I had to, I one, at one time had these, these lectures in one big lecture, and you could see where you could never get through that in an hour. So. Um, do you see, do you ask, are you asked to clear people along the way? Okay. If you are, and you, you know, the asthma thing we already have set up, I'm sure that they would let you at Dr. Lucia's office send your patient over and get the same deal as our students do. Um, and if you're from a dive store, you know, we, uh, other people who um, aren't necessarily college students come, can't go to student health, they can still go there too. Um, and we have a little, a nice little handout on that for folks who want to dive with asthma if that comes up. Um, I think in general you just want to look at, okay, could you lose consciousness? Then the answer is no. And then everything else, you know, look through. You've got some guidelines. You can call Divers Alert Network. You can talk to their specialists. Um, there are other ways to find out uh, if you can clear them or not. And if you yourself want to dive, now you have some um, better ideas. So questions? Anybody have questions about anything? Any other sports medicine questions? <clears throat> Nothing? All right, does anyone have anything they want to talk about or hear about? Topics? that we haven't gone over, we should go over again. I think Maureen's coming next month, right? Maureen's gonna talk sort of about the latest supplements, fad diets, she's our, our registered dietitian. Mm -hmm. You know, some, some things are, we don't see as much, and now we're seeing all these other new things, so I asked her to come talk to us about that, but uh, other issues that you're seeing? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I thought about maybe this summer, and I was going to ask you um, about trying to do a little bit of a, a workshop on just how to reduce some of the common dislocations. I'd have to have one of uh, one of my buddies here be the volunteer. <laughs> volunteer, but I thought you know we could go through some shoulder and elbow and finger, knee, ankle, maybe some of the things that you might you probably wouldn't come across, but. Maybe you're out covering a game, or maybe there isn't somebody else, or you're the one in the ER and love lock or something like that. So I thought maybe we could do that. Um, Penny, do you have something? <laughs> We're having trouble hearing you. Is it bad? Uh, not, not really. Um, I'll follow up with you by email, though. Okay. Thanks. Then may we get Dr. Class. Oh, Dr. Class. Yeah, the April and May. Yeah. Testosterone. testosterone. May yeah. testosterone. Just May. May. So we're going to talk about testosterone use in athletes. Right, yeah. in May. So, but we still need something for April. Or, no, we don't. No, we don't. no, we have Maureen. How, has anyone, just before you leave, I know you guys have to head out, but has anyone had a transgender student athlete yet that's come through or you've had an issue with that? That might be worth talking about. It's going to happen too, and it's going to happen at your level at the high school before it happens in college. Um, so maybe I'll go over sort of what the state of Nevada does and, and those type of things. We could, we could talk about kind of transgender student athletes. If you have other ideas, though, um, send me an email or send one of these guys an email and I can find the specialists. I can get someone to talk. I can come up with a talk myself. Um, and you might, we might want to recycle some of our topics that we haven't talked about for a couple years. But if you can think of some things, let me know so I know what you want to hear and can be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.